everyone. My name is Mike, and this is the Bored Cyborg. Let's talk some horror. Welcome back to yet another episode. Today I'm talking about my top 10 horror films from the decade, from 2010 to 2019. And it was a really difficult list to make, uh, as, as all these end of the decade, end of the year lists were for me. I had to kill a lot of darlings, unfortunately, but I'm pretty content with where my list is at, and I have five honorable mentions as per usual. It was a really solid latter half of the decade in terms of horror. In the early part of the decade, we were struggling. I think we were transitioning <laughs> into a certain, a new style of horror, a new culturally aware style of horror. And um, it was a little confusing, I think, for horror filmmakers in the late 2000s, the late noughts, and the early 2010s. But um, there are a couple on my list from the early 2010s, you know, ones that definitely stand out. But the majority of the films on this list are from, like, mid, mid-decade to the latter part of the decade. So, before I jump into my honorable mentions, I'd love to know what your lists look like for your favorite horror films from the decade. It'll always be interesting. You guys are always giving me some crazy cool lists and some films that I've not seen or heard of. So please feel free to do that down below and we'll get a little discussion. All right, so jumping into my honorable mentions, I want to talk a little bit about a film that I saw earlier on this year, actually, or last year, I should say now. And that is Sadako versus Kayako, a film that I just glossed over. I was like, this isn't going to be very good. Come on. It's the grudge versus the ring. I don't know. I don't have too much faith in it. Oh my God. I loved it. <laughs> it's, it's such a fun movie. Some of the most fun I've had with a horror film the entire decade. This film does not take itself too seriously. It is funny as hell. It is scary at points. It is just fun. It is so much fun and so over the top and ridiculous at points that I couldn't help but fall in love with it. And hell, after all, it's a versus movie in the vein of Freddy vs. Jason. It is uh, Japanese, the Japanese answer to Freddy vs. Jason, for sure. For sure. Now, I only wish that there was more Sadako vs. Kayako happening in the first uh, hour of the film. We really only get their battle in the last 20 minutes, which is epic, by the way. Uh, the majority of the film follows each ghost sort of plaguing uh, certain characters and it, it's really good it, it really kept me interested it's not never boring uh the direction is tight in fact koji shiraishi directed this film he's known for his found footage um japanese horror films like uh, noroi the curse which is excellent and a few others which i haven't seen to be quite honest directed really well funny as hell gr pretty solid performances are all around but it's just fun it brings me back to the old versus days you know, uh, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman, things like that. Honestly, this film deserves to stand neck and neck with all those films. So, awesome movie. All right, next up is Train to Busan. This is a South Korean horror film. So we're going from Japan to South Korea. Excellent. W my favorite zombie film of the decade. Period. My favorite zombie film of the decade. I love it. It's zombies on a train. It's got some of the most intense sequences in any zombie movie I've ever seen. Up there with Romero's tense sequences. It's it's basically a couple guys fighting their way through the cabs. You know, fighting through wave after wave of zombies trying to get to a certain point in the train. It's incredibly cool. And uh, so many great moments and a really heartfelt relationship and performances between a father and a daughter and them trying to reconnect. And that's really what the film is about, but it is a zombie film um, in essence. And so Train to Busan blew me away. Fast-paced, kinetic energy, frenetic action. I absolutely love this movie. A blast from beginning to, to end. Great performances. Can't wait to see what this guy does next with a live-action horror flick, if that's what he chooses to do. Train to Busan. Next up is Hereditary, a film that I sadly do not own yet. I'm going to keep this here for the time being, though. Hereditary... Ari Aster's first film. I mean, Jesus Christ, this dude knocked it out of the park. I gotta be honest, though, the first half of the film, I was like, eh, nah, pretentious a little bit, and uh, wasn't really picking up what the man was putting down. But once I got that, that the film, and I've talked to a few people about this, and nobody really sees it like I do, but the film is darkly humorous. I mean, as dark as dark could get. 
But once I clicked into his sense of like seething dark humor, I was all in. And when this movie goes from being sort of artsy and metaphorical to all out horror in your face, yo, this is what it's about. I f***ing loved it. And I'm not going to say what it's about because it, it'll legitimately spoil it because it would have been spoiled for me if I knew. This film has great performances all around, but it really, really rests on Toni Collette. It is a sin that she wasn't nominated for this goddamn performance because it is incredibly nuanced, incredibly expressive. You feel everything this woman is going through, possibly burgeoning madness. Is she going crazy? Is she not? It definitely deals with those sorts of themes in a really cool and creative way. But Toni Collette just knocks it out of the park. She is so amazing. One of my favorite actors, honestly, doing it right now. She's just so great. Yeah, and it's a story about her coming to terms with her madness or not. And uh, that's all I'll say. Hereditary is excellent. Can't talk about the story much without spoiling it, but definitely check it out. Hereditary. My number 12 is possibly my favorite... My favorite looking film of the decade. Panos Cosmatos is doing things with Mandy that I've never seen in any other film, besides maybe Beyond the Black Rainbow, his first film, which is really good, but he brings it home here. Uh, just the way that he uses lenses, the way he uses focus in really creative and interesting ways and uh, disorienting ways and ways he uses just, just little aspects, little... Uh, neglected aspects of filmmaking and really exploits them like lens flares and the effect that certain lights could have on the the, the camera lens and just exper exploring those ideas with the camera that is so cool to me i can't express that enough now mandy is a maddening movie a psychotic psychedelic son of a bitch of a movie that is so metal and so hard hitting and so trippy that i don't even know what the was going on half the time, but I know I loved it. In fact, it's a pretty simple story about a man and a woman who live in uh, the woods. Uh, I don't want to spoil too much, but essentially a cult does something awful to his wife and he couldn't do, he can't do anything about it in his current state. But once he breaks free, which was an accident, basically the first half of the film is a poem. It's a visual psychedelic poem. Then the second half, it's just like a mainline trip of acid super violent just a descent into violence and madness nick cage's character goes off the hinges in every great way possible in only the way that nick cage could he has a scene that takes place in a bathroom in his underwear where he's chugging whiskey or vodka and just going insane nick cage i've never seen him go this mad i mean he is insane in this role and it's so good he's nick cage turned up to 11 it's amazing and oh my god, I mean, the, the last 40 minutes of the film is just an action sequence of him just getting vengeance on these this fucking creepy, crazy cult. The film feels very 70s. I love it. I love its aesthetic. I love its ending. It's got a killer chainsaw fight. I'm sorry, I couldn't help but spoil it. It's so metal. Mandy. Love it. And my last honorable mention is probably one that not many of you guys have heard of. Bad Milo. Bad Milo is a is a film that is heavily influenced by the work of Frank Henenlotter. I love Frank Henenlotter's work. He's one of my main influences, actually, in my writing. And um, Basket Case and Brain Damage and uh, the Basket Case sequels, Frankenhooker. He made such unique, gritty, grimy New York films, and uh, that that were always like pretty clear allegories of of what to do. You know, no premarital sex, or uh, no, uh, d be careful with drugs, and be careful with premarital sex. I should say this film, Bad Milo, deals with a similar sort of allegorical setup with this this man, this young man, I don't know, in his thirties or something, um, that has an, an anger issue, an anger, you know, anger problems, and this little creature guy, this cute little. <laughs> little shit nugget, comes out of his ass and wreaks havoc, which is sort of his way of expressing his anger. It is a straight-up allegory for, for dealing with anger. 
And it is so funny and so brutal and gruesome and violent and gross at points and uh, very body body horror at points. A little bit of Cronenberg, but Hen and Lauder I like to describe as, as Cronenberg on acid. So it really is more so Hen and Lauder, a bit more reserved than Hen and Lauder, I'd say. But uh, great performances by my man, uh, what's his name? Ken Marino, yeah, who, who's the lead here. And he really does a great job. He reminds me of, uh, reminds me of a few different actors, actually. He reminds me of the guy from Dagon. Kind of reminds me of Jeffrey Combs in a lot of ways, but but I, I love Bad Milo, guys. If you haven't seen it, it, it you got to check it out. It's what, I had to give it an honorable mention. It's such a fun th- sort of throwback to the Hen and Lauder type of film. So Bad Milo, my last honorable mention. All right, guys, getting to my actual list here, my number 10. You know this dude had to make it on my list. James Wan's The Conjuring. James Wan is one of the finest, finest horror directors of our generation, in my opinion. He's got a very traditional style. He uses a lot of tropes and cliches, but he adds his twist to them, adds his his little spice to them, and makes them feel fresh. That's what James Wan excels at. He uses space remarkably. He uses his sets so damn well. Um, You know, there'll be something going on in the background that you don't quite notice at first. In in fact, Flanagan, I I feel like, learned a a few tricks from James Wan, Mike Flanagan, who does this excellently as well, using space and darkness to accentuate the horror. And this film is, uh, it's funny, it's rated R for for horror, for, for scares, which is great. And I'll tell you what, man, when I... This film came at a time where horror was still kind of struggling. I think like 2013 or 14. And uh, the early the early part of the decade was was rough for horror. But I sat down and watched this film alone in my living room, on the couch, well, with my dog. But uh, I was utterly afraid during this film. I was looking behind me, looking out the, you know, checking the window and shit. Yeah, it was like really making me scared, which a movie hadn't done in such a long time so it left such an impression for those reasons this is a a a a possession story this is a story about a woman a mother who was possessed and these two patrick wilson and vera formiga's formiga her character they play the warren siblings who are based on real people from my home state connecticut and um, they're paranormal investigators, and they go in and try to figure out what the hell's going on. Things get increasingly more disturbing. Great sequences in this that really, honestly scared me. I love The Conjuring. It had to make my list. It just had to. I love James Wan's work, The Conjuring. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Deathgasm. My number nine. Again, came out at a time where horror wasn't doing too much for me in terms of impressing me, um, you know, with new ideas. And Deathgasm, it's a new-ish idea. It's a horror comedy, but it blends metal and the metal, uh, heavy metal sort of aesthetic and uh, sound and uh, way of life. It blends that with horror, and god damn are they a match made in heaven. This, f- this film has a killer soundtrack, by the way. Found a lot of really cool... I think this film is from New Zealand. And I found a lot of really cool New Zealand like uh, metal bands like Beast Wars and stuff um, that one of their songs plays during the uh, climax of this film, which is incredible. All practical effects, gory as hell. Gory as hell. It's like Evil Dead type level of gore. And uh, it's got our main character who is just great. He's sort of an outcast, you know, and uh, finds this young girl who is sort of more popular and everything and he basically ends up turning her into a a metalhead once all this crazy shit hits the fan but essentially these two uh lead characters i forget their names forgive me but one's like the super cool metal guy and the other the main character is trying to trying to fit in right and so they they spark up a friendship and they find this piece of sheet music that um once played unleashes the devil uh unleashes demons and makes everybody f***ing start puking black shit out of their mouth and blood and gore and transfiguring them and transmutating them into these wild creatures zombie-like creatures it is just a blast from start to finish the most fun i've had you know i, I had had with a a horror film in in a really long time so i love deathgasm as a fan of metal um I, you know uh, not a crazy fan i don't dig too deep but i i do love the genre as a fan of metal music and and horror films, this was the perfect marriage of those two. Um, I mean, there's there's even a joke about uh, a, a, a band called Anal f- so, which is really funny. I don't know if I'll be able to say that on YouTube, though. So, anyway, Deathgasm, my number eight. All right, you know a found footage film had to make it onto this list. My number eight 
is unfriended dark web. I know, I might be in the minority here. I loved Unfriended. In fact, I did a review for it on my channel. Feel free to check that out. I got all my thoughts out on it uh, pretty pretty successfully, I, I thought. And uh, I didn't do a review of Dark Web, so I'll try to do a quick one here. Unfriended blew me away with its format. That's what it did really well. It didn't tell a new and creative story, but it told us a, a, an old story that we've seen time and time again through new and creative means. And that's the desktop life or the screen life genre where the whole film takes place on a desktop screen. Something that we all know very, very well here in 2020. So Unfriended blew me away with its format, not so much with its story. But Unfriended Dark Web blew me away on both fronts. Now, it's still not a like a, the best story ever told, but it's a really creepy story about the dark web. It follows our characters who are having a game night. They get in way over their head with some really deep dark web dangerous shit. And they start hitting the, you know, kicking the bucket one by one in kind of typical slasher fashion. But what separates it is the way that this story is told and the cameras use the, the medium. It's so incredible. It's using found footage in a way that I had never seen. And it blew my mind. Honestly, this film is like near perfect. I don't have much negative to say about it. The performances are all believable. Um, and, and there's some really funny moments, the comic relief and everything some really tense moments, and our, our lead character who we're kind of seeing everything through, it's his screen, you really end up feeling for him and his girlfriend, which he is, uh, who he's trying to save by the end of the film, and uh, no uh, no lights at the end of this tunnel, it's a super dark film, uh, that, that nihilistic as hell, there's no hope, no hope in this movie, and killer, killer last shot, hell of a twist ending, fucking loved it. Can't say what it was, though. It'll spoil it. But excellent. I loved it. This is my favorite found footage film of the decade. There were a few that I loved, like found footage 3D, but uh, Unfriended, in terms of its format and what it brought new to and fresh to the genre, got my number eight spot. Love Unfriended Dark Web. My number seven is The Witch. My introduction to Robert Eggers. The world's introduction to Robert Eggers. And my introduction to Anna Taylor-Joy, Anna Taylor-Joy, who I adore, not only is she a fantastic actress, and she's going to be, she's going to be, I have a feeling she's going to be big one day, but she is beautiful as well. She is so phenomenal in this movie. I mean, she is, is, is reserved and confused and just, just carries the movie on, on her shoulders, really. And it's a really impressive outing for her. But The Witch excels in its authenticity. That's what Robert Eggers does so well. He researches this shit to the T, gets all the mythology down, gets the time period down, and it feels like you're watching something filmed in the time that this takes place, which I want to say is late 18th century. This movie, I was worried that it wasn't going to go full supernatural. I thought it was going to be more artsy and allegorical, but that's what I love about these artsy films from this decade, these horror films. They blend the artsy, the artsy style with true traditional horror and the the witch does just that in fact it reminds me of the shining it has a father who's sort of going mad and a lot of other themes that sort of uh tie into the shining for me hey and in the first 10 minutes in fact the first five minutes a baby is stolen and ground into baby meat with a mortar and pestle and consumed eaten so any movie that does that in the first five, ten minutes, I am fucking in. And I was in for this movie. I love The Witch. Robert Eggers, keep doing your thing, man. I, I love your work. The Witch. My number six is another film that I sadly don't own. I just haven't run into it. I, I can't believe I haven't run into this movie yet. But that is What We Do in the Shadows, my favorite horror comedy of the decade. Hands down. This movie totally surprised me. It's totally floored me. I had no idea who the Flight of the Concord guys were. I actually I had an idea, but I had never watched their sketch comedy show. Um, I've watched a bit now, and it's great. Taika Waititi and uh, Jerome Clement. Something, I think that's his name. Anyway, those two star in this film. They also wrote it. Yeah, wrote it. You know, they. I read something like they had 500 hours or something of, uh, of uh, improvisation. That's what's so cool about this film. It it really feels organic and natural, and I, lo I know a lot of it was 
was uh, because they were so deep in character that they were just improvising. And, and god damn, th- this movie is so funny. It follows a group of vampires who are basically like have a, a frat house, you know, essentially. They're, they have a flat together. And it just follows them on their day-to-day business, uh, being vampires and going out at night and finding fresh blood and in really brutal, <laughs> horrific scenes. But it balances the off-the-cuff sort of rambling humor of these everyday life you know day-to-day lives of these vampires and it's just it's brilliant you know you have like they're all different ages so you have the younger one who's like only a couple hundred years old who's like all about going out and getting getting fucked up and shit and then you have a then you have like the super old one like that looks like the nos like nosferatu and he just barely is moving around he's like a thousand years old so it plays with all the uh all the tropes of the vampire lore and uh, the vampire movies of, of old and even deconstructs them, which is so brilliant. And uh, I, I don't know where the sequel is, werewolves, you know. Uh, they're, they're basically, in the movie, there's a, a clan of werewolves who are the same kind of thing. They're just people. They're just guys who happen to be werewolves. So it's just such a funny and such a creative idea. I know there's a show now. I'm not sure how the show is. I've heard pretty good things, but uh, maybe one day I'll get to that. But goddamn, I love what we do in the shadows. Uh, It is my number six. Man, uh, Robert Eggers, on the list twice. The Lighthouse is my number five. I like The Lighthouse, obviously, even more than The Witch, and that's because of its utilization of... And if you've seen my other videos um, uh, talking about the films of the decade and films of 2019, I'm going to sound like a broken record, so forgive me, but The Lighthouse uses black and white and aspect ratio and... um, all these technical things that we love about uh, about black and white films and day and films of days past, he uses these things unlike anybody I've ever seen, and that's because they're so far removed from the era of the four three aspect ratio and the the black and white um, grainy sort of look to the way that movies were filmed, which is wonderful. And he uses cameras from the 30s and 40s and lenses and equipment from that time to make the film feel as authentic as possible. It's a period piece, again, that takes place like mid-19th century, I want to say. Follows Robert, or Robert, follows, yeah, Robert Pattinson's character and Willem Dafoe's character, um, who are lighthouse attendants on a small island. And it deals with isolation and madness. Uh, Honestly... Not as well as the thing, but god damn it, it approaches it in terms of isolation. But uh, madness is really what this film is all about. Just a downward spiral of uh, what isolation and what lack of sociability, you know, social life does to you and lack of human interaction can do to you. It's really interesting. It, it's really, the chemistry between the two actors is incredible. The imagery, some of it will burn into your mind forever. I absolutely love this movie, and and the black bars on the side of the screen. I've said this before, but they really help to make it make us feel confined and in this lighthouse with these characters. And the cinematography is was deservedly nominated for an Academy Award. It should have been nominated for Best Picture and, and Actors, but it is what it is. It's the Academy. And I absolutely love this film, guys. It is my number five. Again, if you've seen my video of my top ten films from the decade, uh, these, the rest of these films showed up on that list. So um, I will talk about them briefly, uh, try to sum up my feelings, but... Number four is Under the Skin. This is a masterpiece of of atmosphere and tension and subtlety. Scarlett Johansson plays this alien, this uh, creature who is disguised as a human, who is finding these young men, and I can't say what she's doing with them. I'm still not 100% sure what she's doing with them. It's very up for interpretation. Interpretation. But all, all I'll say is she's finding these guys, these unassuming guys, unsuspecting guys, and processing them in very unique ways <laughs> and uh it is such an incredibly moody movie so inspirational and influential to me in fact i have a whole story of my own that was inspired by the aesthetic and the feel of this movie hopefully one day i'll get it to the screen and um i love under the skin it's my number four my number three jeremy Saulnier's green room this movie is incredible. It follows a band of struggling punk punk artists, uh, you know, punk a punk band that is struggling to even get by, to get from job to job, gig to gig, to find food, and uh, they're desperate. So they take this uh, this this gig at this uh, sort of neo-Nazi 
venue that is headed by Patrick Stewart, who is killer in this role as the head of the neo-Nazi sect, per se. Anton Yelchin's character, rest in peace, homie, uh, you were, he was so good in this movie. After the show, after they kill it, you know, they do a really good show, everybody loves it, all the Nazi punks love it. They even play Nazi punks, Nazi punks by Dead Kennedys. I'm kind of a punk fan, forgive me, and uh, especially Dead Kennedys. But he sees something that he wasn't supposed to see. And that ends up catapulting them into this tense, violent night that they are just trying to survive and get out of there. It's such a well-constructed script. Everything makes sense. Every every decision that's made, you're like, that, that makes sense. That that would happen in this sort of situation. It is jarringly violent at points. It, he plays with violence. Saulnier always does this in his films, and he plays with violence in really interesting ways. You know, you'll think something's about to be crazy violent, but he'll wait. He'll wait on it and and compound your, your expectations and your tension, and then all of a sudden he'll give it to you out of nowhere. And it's just, like, so extreme and so brutal. And I love this. It's a film about... Uh, the perpetuity of hate um, and the courage that one could find in him in himself or in a society really to fight up and stand against that hate and that evil and it, it's a really special film i absolutely love it it's my number three my number two all these are some of my favorite horror films ever honestly so get out my number two. I've seen the film twice now. It was even better on a rewatch because you kind of know everything that's going on. You're like, oh, that's why they're doing that. That's why Peel's sort of setting this scene up that way. This film is an incredible. It's about what it means, what it's like to be an African-American in this country, a black person in this country. It's a perspective that we sadly haven't seen much of. There aren't many horror films directed by black directors. And you can go back to, you know, ex black exploitation stuff, you know, uh, Ganja and Hess and Mr. Black and Dr. Hyde, things like that. You know, Blackula, those were more cheesy, can't be fun. Ganja and Hess, not so much. And it's a perspective that more people need to, need to see, need to understand. Um, and that's what, what, what is so powerful about film. We're able to see the perspective of, of a, a black director and, and writer telling us what it's like to experience that life on a daily basis and it really makes you feel for the characters and it's an incredible incredible exploration of those ideas i've never seen anything like it and aside from that it's one hell of a horror film with so many really deeply frightening ideas about um about the elite about the rich and uh it's so creepy <laughs> one of the best scenes of all t all 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 of these movies, honestly, one of the best scenes is the hypnotize, the hypnotization scene, which is just so tense. I had to pause it when I was watching it. Honestly, I was getting super anxious. And uh, I love Get Out. It's my number two. And my number one. I adore this film so much. It's in my top 30. Mama just killed a man. Mother. Mother is my, is my favorite horror film of the decade. I absolutely love this movie. It may be controversial. Some of you may not think, may not consider this a horror film, but it is absolutely a psychological horror film about Jennifer Lawrence's character who plays mother, who is leading a completely peaceful life, uh, well kept, everything is, is uh, in order, and is functioning as it should. And all of a sudden, people start showing up. More and more people start showing up in her house. She doesn't know why. She doesn't know where they're coming from, who they are, what their motives are. But by the end of the film, her house is packed. Her home is packed with people. And this is a this film is a strong, distinct allegory for what the human species is doing to our planet. And this speaks to me on a very, very deep level. I care about these themes deeply that is one of the main reasons why this film is sitting here aside from that this is a visual poem aronofsky is a poet and he expresses these ideas about our planet about our home that he draws such a perfect allegory that i it's one of those things that's like why didn't i think of that it's the perfect allegory for what we're doing to our planet 
And it's incredible. I mean, it, it is... Once I learned what Aronofsky was trying to communicate, it was like he was speaking to me. You know, it was one of those situations where the director was speaking directly to me. And I felt like it was a movie made for me. And it, it is. It is a movie made for me. It's... I believe in what the director is trying to say here. It's an important movie. More people need to understand what this movie is trying to say and appreciate it for what it is. It was controversial for the time, still is, but I think 10 years down the road, this will be looked back as one of the important important films of the, of the century and one of the more important films, um, maybe ever, honestly, uh, of, of, in what it's trying to say. It is extremely pertinent, extremely important. I love it to death. Mother, I just want to thank you all for checking out my list of my top 10 horror movies from the decade. Such a great latter half of the decade. Like you like you probably could tell, the earlier half of the decade was a little rough. You know, I, I got to mention Tucker and Dale vs. Evil here. I had to chop that one. And Exism, or Excision, I love those two movies as well, which were earlier on in the decade. But really came into its own towards the middle of the decade and towards the uh, end of the decade. And I think I know some of the reasons why, you know, social reasons why. And it's uh, really important to see horror sort of grow up and uh, take uh, and, and change and evolve and actually become something really exciting and new again and refreshing. So hopefully you guys enjoyed my list. I can't wait to see your list. So please feel free to leave those down in the comments below and we'll get a little discussion rolling. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to give it a thumbs up. And if you're new to the channel and want to see more videos like it, go ahead and hit the subscribe button as well as the little bell for notifications. Anyway, guys, I will see you next time. Bored Cyborg is out. Mama just killed a man. I can't feel my legs. <laughs>